But ants, the bane of my life. I am scared of ants. I do not like ants at all. Don't care what colour they are. I just don't like them at all. They make my skin crawl. Hello and welcome to this week's Natural Gardening Live with me, Josie Rainbird, your natural gardening coach. So we're talking about natural pest control in your garden. So I've got five ways you can manage your pest populations in your garden naturally. I've got um, five ways to manage pests in your garden naturally, but I also would like to go through, if you let me, um, but I also want to talk about the benefits of having a few pests living in your garden living around your garden and how they can actually promote the overall health of your garden. So they're not all bad, it's about balance. It's about balance. So if you let me, I'd like to talk about, give it the other side, the flip of the coin. Let me know in the comments if you've had a particular issue with a particular pest in your garden or pests, what caused the most issues in your garden and have you tried anything natural to get rid of them, to help manage their is um, the issue that you've got with them, prevent damage, that sort of thing. Let me know in the comments. So we've all got issues, we've all had issues from time to time. I can confidently say that, we've all had issues from time to time with pests. The motivation, once you see the pests in your garden, the motivation to get rid and clear the garden of all signs of these pests is very strong. It's very strong. I know I've been there, I understand. It's motivating, <laughs> to say the least. When you start seeing that damage, it just lights a fire and that's it, you've got to get rid of them all. But had you stopped to think that what these pests if kept under control, are actually supporting in your garden, the ecosystem that they're supporting. Had you actually stopped to think how they can actually contribute to your garden's health and well-being? To be honest, this is actually quite a rare thing to enter a gardener's brain or mind when they're in that pest defensive mode. Um, so yes, I completely understand if you hadn't even thought about this. Pest defensive mode. We've all had that, we all know what that is, pest defensive. Um, so different pests will provide food for different uh, beneficial insects for your garden. And these insects, you want them to call your garden their home. So if you're there trying to clear out all the pests that they're trying to eat with whatever products you want to use, they aren't gonna wanna call your garden their home. They just want to. They can create and provide um, nutrients. They can process the organic matter in the soil as well. These, these insects and pests and things that you're trying to kill off, these invertebrates as well. They can create and provide different nutrients for your garden. They can process, as I say, the organic matter in the soil to make your garden a happier and healthier place for your plants to grow, which is what we want at the end of the day. We want the garden to help support itself and provide the nutrients that your plants need. And these dudes, they do help do this. As much as they can cause damage, they can help do this as well. And they can also complete the life cycle of your plants, which helps you to have more plants in your garden. So when I say complete the life cycle, I mean like pollination, helping the seeds to germinate, helping the seeds to travel as well. All these different things, they help complete the life cycle of your plants, help the seeds to grow and move throughout your garden and then create more plants for you. So they do actually, they do in a kind of a roundabout sort of way, they are helping the system. But as I say, it's all about balance. If they're out balance, then it all goes wrong. As I say, without these pests, the ecosystem in your garden will be missing a vital link and it will stop the system running smoothly. So we don't really want to clear them all out, but keep the balance under control, the populations under control, keep them in balance. And it's only when they kind of get ahead of themselves that they, that you start to see the issues that they cause, they get, um, their populations grow faster, they start to cause damage to your garden because the, there's no backup, there's no, um, there's no, what's the word? There's no predators to come in to keep the population under control because the system, the ecosystem that they are a part of is out of balance and it isn't there to support the change that's happened. So the population growth, there's nothing there to back it up to keep them under control. So it's only at this point that we have to go on the defensive, on the pest defensive, and um, you see them, you treat them, you clear them out, which we don't need to be doing. So this is where these five tips I've got for you today, these five ways of managing your pests in your garden naturally come in and believe me, they work. They do work as much as you, you may need to see it to believe it sometimes. I know some things, but they do work. They won't damage the garden or the beneficial insect living in your garden and will support your garden over a long period of time. So shall we crack on? Number one, so companion planting. Now I know we've spoken about this before, but it's something I feel very strongly about and it's an incredibly good resource for your garden. So companion plants can be broken down into a few different defensive measures. Scent, physical cover, actually physically the plant does the job, physical cover and attracting beneficial insects. 
So to say about keeping the system in balance, keeping the whole ecosystem running smoothly, beneficial insects are a, a big important part to that. I know we have spoken about this before, so I will link the videos that I have got, I think I'll play an entire playlist devoted to companion planting. I will link that in the description. I will also add them into the comments so you can find those, you can watch those later. So I won't go into massive detail on the companion planting right now, because I know we have done a lot of work on this before. And especially if you're in the membership, we have covered companion planting to the nth degree and the very different resources I have got available in the um, files section in the membership group. So if you're a member, have a look in the membership group because there's a lot more resources in there for you as well. You know, very strong and effective way to support the overall health of your garden and the fence of your garden. And will go a long way to managing the pest damage and keeping away the pest defensive anxiety that we all suffer when we see a, a rose bud covered in aphids. Yes, you know the feeling. Um, so yes, yeah, so it keeps that at bay. So now point number two, coming slightly off of the companion planting point, is decoy plants. Now, they're not technically a companion plant, but in my eyes they are because they complement the garden. So that in my eyes is a companion plant. Um, I use the decoy plants mainly in my vegetable patch, which I know we've spoken about before. Um, mainly in my vegetable patch but you can use them in any part of your garden. Usually around plants that are vulnerable, um, which suffer certain pest issues, um, damage, attract more pests than they deserve, that sort of thing. So you usually use a, compa a, a companion plant, a decoy plant in this situation. When you need to give this plant, these plants particular assistance and give them a bit of respite from the issues with the pest that they're suffering from. So I use some flowers. Um, I use them in my veg patch, but as I say, you can use them in any part of the garden. I use sunflowers and my lupins in my veg patch work very well as this as well. So um, these plants, so the sunflowers and lupins attract certain pests, um, but they, they're very, they are strong enough, get my teeth in, they are strong enough to withstand the damage that these pests can cause. Sunflowers attract, and the lupins in that matter as well, um, they attract soft-bodied insects. They attract black fly, green fly, that sort of thing. Um, they all gather on this one plant, as I say, giving the garden a bit of respite. So they all travel because they love the plant and they um, can feed on the plant. The plant's strong enough to withstand it. So they're gonna keep building and keep building on this one plant. The, most of the population of the pests in the garden are going to group onto this one plant. And this also provides, which is incredibly clever and quite sneaky, it provides a buffet for your sort of one-stop shop for the um, predators of these insects. So it's amazing really if you've ever if you do this let me know in the comments because it's really good when it next happens in the garden when i next see it um, on my sunflowers i'm going to take a picture of it because you get the, the black fly on the stem and usually sometimes around the back of the flower as well but you get them gathered and then you get an abundance of ladybirds as well so you get the black and the red and it's quite cool to watch really and the um ladybird nymphs as well when they're all the larvae when they're um ready to hatch into the adult ladybird. They're kind of stuck onto the side of the sunflower. So they've feasted themselves on the black fly or the aphids, and then they're ready to turn themselves into an adult ladybird. You get a nice little like, collection of different colors on the stem of the sunflower. Sunflowers are fine, they couldn't care less. They're, they're strong and they're, they don't mind. But having that little system going on on the plant, it protects the rest of the garden. As I say, it gives it a bit of respite. And if they have got plants near this decoy plant that would normally get like stripped if you like or damaged by the aphids and the black fly and whatever then they, they're doing their job they're doing a really good job of protecting these plants giving the rest of the garden a bit of respite and keeping the whole system running smoothly whilst the population of the, this insect is being controlled nicely and you're attracting in the beneficial insects at the same time so decoy plants very useful there are lots of different plants you could use for this but you've got to, the key is um this plant has to be strong enough to withstand the damage and um, gather a strong population of this pest. So that's why I use sunflowers because they're very strong. And black fly, I love them. Where did I get to? Number three, essential oils. Now I don't talk a lot about essential oils in here, but they do have their place. They are a very effective tool, I think, um, to have in our little pest management arsenal, or natural pest management arsenal, I should say, and should not be underestimated. So this, in my mind, kind of relates to the companion planting when you use scent to um, protect the plants. So the essential oils 
they are plant essential oils, so they come from the plants. I'm not going to go into detail of how they extract the essential oils from plants because they do it differently for every plant and the uses for essential oils are massive. You can use them for all different things. So you can provide, they can provide pest management benefits. They can be antifungal treatments. Um, they can attract beneficial insects. You could make, oh, a good one that I saw the other day was make a lavender, use lavender essential oils, make a lavender spray um, to attract butterflies to your garden. I am going to try that because um, we haven't seen a lot of butterflies yet this year and I'd like to attract a few more in. So I'm going to try that this year and see how it goes. Look out for that video. It can be used directly by um, having like a saucer of water and dropping the essential oils onto the saucer and leave them in a greenhouse to like, what's the word? I want to say evaporate, but it's not. It's like diffuse. Or dropping them directly onto the soil. That can help as well, um, especially for antifungal. You can use that. You can make a spray, as I was saying about the lavender spray, you can make a spray that you directly spray onto the plants as like a foliar treatment. You can do that as well. So there's all sorts of different ways that you can use essential oils and they do offer so many different benefits to your garden. Number four. Now this is diatomaceous earth is what I wanted to talk about, but natural resources in general, really. So diatomaceous earth is made of like fossilized algae and crustaceans. Um, they create, they break it down and create a powder which is a very effective way to manage wood lice, um, woolly aphids, standard aphids, um, I think slugs, but I've never had a definitive answer of whether it's helped with slugs. Never used it for slugs or anything like that, but yeah. yeah. But using natural resources like diatomaceous earth to prevent pest populations getting out of control in your garden is a really good way of preventing the residue from certain products being left in the soil. So you can use it quite safely and know that after a good couple of rains, it's going to be dispersed and it's going to dissolve away and it's not going to be an issue over a long period of time. So they're not going to leave any residue behind. It's not going to negatively affect your garden over a long period of time, but they are very effective. So using natural resources to protect your garden, so say such as diatomaceous earth, to um, weed soaks as well, like tomato leaf weed soaks to um, prevent but it's like a pest spray and things like that. They don't leave residue behind. They are going to negatively affect your garden for over a long period of time. So they are going to be much more of a benefit than they are a negative. If that makes sense. So natural resources. Um, and number five. Oh, we got to number five. Excellent. Supporting specific beneficial insects in your garden. Now this, um, in my mind, was thinking about the, you have the pest that you have most of the problems with which is what I was asking earlier. And then you find the predator that belongs to that pest, that feeds on that pest. Support that predator. So if you know the issue, if you have an issue with a particular nuisance pest and you work out the predator that you've got, um, ladybirds or hoverflies for aphids, um, lacewing larvae for soil grubs, that side of things. So if you find the predator for them, to help support. Um, there'll always be a natural predator there will always be a natural predator. But when there's food, there'll be something to feed on or feed, whatever, um, to eat it. <laughs> be, when there's food, there's something to eat it. I know what I mean to say. Um, so yes, yeah, so all you have to do is find out what this thing is, this predator is, and support it. So companion planting can help with this, but the key is, companion planting can help, but the key is um, to find out how these predators live and how you can make their gar your garden home for them and how you can attract them in. So understanding how they feed, how they live, and the things they look for in a home, and incorporate this into your garden, to which then will attract them to your garden, then. So, understand how it works? So it's not just enough to have the food there, they've got to have the whole environment. So if you find out these little things about how they want to live, then they'll come running, and they're gonna have the food there ready to support them, so it's all nice. But um, ha understanding the predator for these insects. Now this predator won't just feed on this one type of insect. There'll be other things that it will feed on as well to support your garden. So that is an incredibly, that's a good one to finish on actually. Um, that's a very good way of looking at the pest management in your garden. Look at the counter for it. So you've got a pest countered with the predator. How am I gonna support the predator to then control the pest? You don't have to do the work then. All you have to do is work out what's missing in your garden and why that predator isn't living in your garden to work out why the pests are getting out of control. In a roundabout sort of way, that's quite simple, really. <laughs> yeah, simple. Um, so yes, so I hope these five tips or five ways of um, supporting 
managing, supporting, managing the pest populations in your garden will actually be useful to you and you can start implementing them to help managing your garden naturally or supporting your garden naturally. Hopefully you find this useful. Check out the description bit at the top here and the comments for the companion planting playlist that I've got and the companion planting guide. That I've got the free guide um, that I've got so that will have a bit more information in there for you as well. If you're in the membership, have a look for the companion planting resources I've got in the file, so there'll be a lot more in there for you guys. And on that note, um, have a good day and we'll see you later. Ba, 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 ba.